please welcome to the stage virtually Peter Diamandis and Hugh Price. Hello everyone, as you can see you've got the, the real me uh, and I, th I hope a virtual Peter. Hi, Hello you. Peter. Hi, good, good afternoon. To, good to see you again. Um, yes, you too. And, and thank you for joining us. Now, what we're going to do today is to have a, a fireside chat with the, with the whole room. But first of all, Peter, I'm going to I'm, I, I'm going to raise a few questions of my own. Uh, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that I've got you to myself for a few minutes before we, we open it up for general Q and A. Um, Peter, of course, everyone knows the X Prize brand, but we don't all know the history, and here I'm including myself. Perhaps you could start off by telling us where the idea came from, how it started, what the philosophy was, that sort of thing. Uh, sure, I'll do it in brief. The, the reality is that uh, you know, prizes are not a very new concept. They've been around for a while, the Longitude Prize. Uh, probably the prize that got me excited about this was something called the RT Prize that was uh, offered in 1919 by a Frenchman, Raymond Rote, for the first person to fly nonstop between New York and Paris, or Paris and New York. If you need the trade winds, you go uh, eastward. And that $25,000 prize offered in 1919 sparked nine different teams to spend $400,000 trying to win this, uh, this $25,000 prize. And what was important was when the prize was offered in 1919, it was considered a crazy idea, the idea of flying nonstop over that large distance. And by 1927, when Lindbergh uh, made the flight, um, he was the most unlikely person to pull it off, meaning he had flown far fewer hours than any of the other teams that went in, uh, but yet he won. And when I read Lindbergh's biography called The Spirit of St. Louis, um, I was blown away by the economics of the prize. That, $25,000 prize, drove $400,000 in team expenditures, and that that prize really launched today's you know, $400 billion aviation industry. You can trace it back very clearly. Um, so by the time I finished reading that book, uh, the idea of uh, an incentive competition, right? There are historical prizes like the Pulitzer Prize, the Nobel Prize that reward someone for work done a few years ago, or in some cases, three decades ago, um, this was an incentive competition. This is, I don't care where you're from, where you went to school, what you've ever done. If you solve this problem and demonstrate it, you win. And so uh, I launched on the heels of that, reading that book, something called the I'm Sorry X Prize, now called I'm Sorry X Prize, a private space flight offering up uh, $10 million of money I didn't have at the time, uh, regardless for the first person who could build a private spaceship carrying three adults up into space, land safely, and do it again within two weeks. And it took me uh, from 1994 when I had the idea to 96 when we announced it under the Arch of St. Louis. Uh, it took another eight years to 2004 for the prize to be won. On the heels of that, uh, we've since launched about $300 million of prizes. Uh, last year, we launched our largest ever $100 million prize that Elon funded for gigaton carbon removal. But we've had prizes for mapping the ocean floor, pulling oil out of the oceans, from oil spills, to uh, educating kids in the middle of Tanzania with no literate adults in schools. Um, any place where you can describe a concrete, measurable, objective goal that typically people think it can't be done. If it could be done, and it's happening anyway, it's not a great place for a prize. Prize can accelerate those things, but it's really, uh, prize is doing an amazing job where it's, it's getting people to say, huh, I wonder, could I do that? How would I do that? And um, you get to a parallel innovation going, not, you know, so for the Gigaton Carbon Rule Prize, we've had 1,100 teams enter that competition, as an example. We'll typically have at least a few dozen, uh, 200s. In this case, we broke over 1,000 teams. And, and do, do you have a, um, a favorite prize? You've been, so you've been running almost 20 years. 
since the, um, the space prize. Oh, I, I think I'll, I'll jokingly use the line that Bert Rutan shared. He said, my favorite, he said, you say my favorite airplane's my next one. So my favorite prize is my, uh, my next one. We have a few that are, are amazing. Uh, we have one we're on the verge of getting funded. It's a wildfire prize and for any of us living in California. That is an issue. And this prize is asking teams, can you detect a wildfire at ignition? Um, and if it's greater than two meters in size, or if it's moving, put it out in 10 minutes. Right? Avoid the campfires, avoid the grills, <coughs> identify a wildfire that shouldn't exist, and put it out. And I don't care how you put it out. Water balloons, water cannons, drones, robots, doesn't matter, but it's you know, when's the best time to detect a wildfire at the start, right? Same thing for cancer. Uh, another X Prize that I'm diligently uh, working on right now is an age reversal X Prize. Um, it's a $101 million prize. Uh, Chip Wilson, who's underwritten half of it, he put up $51 million. Uh, and you might ask why is it 101? Well, he wanted it to be, wanted it to be bigger than Elon's prize at 100 million. So <laughs> Um, and that's for reversing biological human age by 20 years or more with a therapeutic that lasts for under a year. So uh, we're two thirds funded with that prize. I really want to get launched this year. I'm contributing there. I think it's a area that could use new thinking, new innovators, uh, attention. One of the things that we do with prizes in particular that's an advantage is we bring brand new talent into the field that didn't exist before, new approaches. A lot of times in these competitions, the traditional players, like in the original uh, X Prize for space flight, we did not have Boeing or Lockheed or Orbital Sciences or any of the traditional players, because there's no incentive for them. If they lose, people say, well, look, you just lost this startup, and if they win, they say, what, you did this for a $10 million prize and you couldn't have done it on your own before. So it really brings uh, typically smaller teams, non-traditional teams, uh, to the table. Um, the other thing that these prizes do, Hugh, as we've discussed, is they provide a level playing field uh, so that uh, we can compare lots of different approaches. So another prize that was a great one was when the BP oil spill hit in 2010. Uh, James Cameron was on my board uh, at that time, and he said, we gotta do something about this spill. It was mucking up the beaches, it was going on and on and on. And we ended up coming up with an idea of we couldn't cap the spill uh, on the, uh, on the BP, uh, platform, but what if we could reinvent how to clean up the spill faster, so we could clean up the oil on the ocean surface before it hits the beach land and messed up the fisheries and the beaches. And uh, we had 430 teams enter that competition. We basically had the, uh, we narrowed them down to 10 finalists and we said your solution has to fit the shipping container. And your shipping container needs to be uh, the top 10 had to send their fishing, their, their shipping container to a facility in New Jersey uh, in Omset, it was the world's largest oil spill cleanup. And so we had 10 different approaches show up at this facility. Um, one of the teams was a fishing family out of Alaska that really invested their uh, life savings. They came in like, like, like third. One of the teams was a team that came out of Las Vegas that tattoo artist had the idea for the prize uh, and for the, for the engineering of it, and one of his uh, customers funded it. They tested it in the guy's jacuzzi because they couldn't get access to a larger facility, and it actually became one of the top uh, top four or five solutions. So you get very non-traditional players going after these things, uh, and sometimes traditional ones too. But um, it's got to be measurable. It's got to be objective, uh, and ultimately we end up getting not a single solution, but lots of solutions, uh, and hopefully kick off an entire industry. So there are lots of uh, elements that make these prizes uh, really work well with innovation. Thank you. Yeah, there, there's, a, there, there's a, a great tradition of um, technological solutions in bathtubs. 
I'm thinking of Archimedes. <laughs> yes, I remember. <laughs> Wasn't an expert. <laughs> um, okay, um, you've told us about lots of um, great things. Are there any X prizes that you feel uh, are, are duds or, or failures, uh, or, or, or simply weren't won by anyone? Yeah, so we, we had a great question, and I'm fond of saying if 100% of the prizes we launch are won, <clears throat> then we're clearly making a mistake, because it's too easy. Uh, we're looking for the intersection of audacious and achievable prizes. Um, in, oh God, 2007, I think it was, thereabouts, uh, Larry Page had introduced me to Craig Hunter, and Craig, had sequenced his human genome in 2001 and had put up a half million dollar prize for the thousand dollar genome. And uh, Craig ended up joining our board and put his $500,000 forward towards a larger prize and we ended up raising a $10 million prize called the Archon Genome X Prize for the first thousand dollar genome. And we had started the prize, we had the capital, we had the rules going, but what happened was that the rate at which sequencing breakthroughs were occurring, if you've ever seen sort of the cost of uh, human genome sequencing, they were dropping at five times Moore's Law. There's a very beautiful chart of that occurring. And we got to a point where we said, you know, this is happening with or without a prize. And it's not a good place for a prize to be. So we ended up, much to the chagrin, in particular one of the teams who really had some beautiful technology, not uh, not launching the prize, even though it was ready for launch. Uh, and today, we've gone from a hundred million dollars for Craig's uh, genome and nine months down to a hundred dollars per genome in seven hours. So it's been progressing pretty extraordinarily. Uh, another prize that <clears throat> didn't get won uh, was a, our Google Lunar Prize. So uh, after the original prize was, was won for spaceflight, we were having uh, uh, dinner at the Googleplex with a group of our board members and benefactors and said, what's our next space prize going to be? And we said, how about a private lunar landing prize? Uh, not for humans, but for a robot. And the prize that was set, and it was another learning from this, was, uh, was a, a $30 million prize. Um, and it was going to be for the first team who could land a private robot on the moon, uh, take photos and videos, or I should say photos and YouTube videos, send them back to Earth, rove a half a kilometer. Uh, you could rove or you could hop, and then send back more photos and videos. And we had uh, about 30 teams enter that competition. And it was originally set to expire uh, in six years. Google did an amazing job of extending it uh, a few additional times. By the end of 10 years, uh, the, uh, the period of the prize had run out. Um, and it turned out a year later, uh, the Israeli team did that had competed in this competition did make a, a landing on the moon, uh, albeit a kinetic landing. Uh, they, they didn't survive the impact. Uh, they had difficulty with, their, with the uh, software on their uh, descent stage. Uh, but a number of the teams that entered that, there's a massive amount of, uh, of startup uh, capital that went in and a, a number of companies that are now part of NASA's lunar economy that came out of that competition, so we're proud of that. I would say one of the lessons we learned from that competition was we made it a little bit too difficult, uh, meaning uh, rather than just saying land on the moon privately and send back a photo, the idea of having to land and then move and then send back more photos and videos as if a private landing on the moon wouldn't have been enough. So it's, you know, there are lessons learned every time that we succeed and every time we fail. Um, some of the things that we do today in prizes that we didn't do originally uh, was we'll offer out uh, tiered prizes where 80% of the prize purse may be for the ultimate solution, but uh, we might offer 10% of the prize purse a, a year or two into the competition to the top teams and then another 10% to a smaller subset of teams. 
all the teams can continue to compete, but it just puts capital into the field because uh, sometimes even that small amount of capital, 100,000 here or there, uh, can make a big difference for uh, a startup team in the lab. Thank you, Peter. That's, um, that's all fascinating. Um, I, I've learned a lot that I didn't know, and, and as an Australian, I'm particularly pleased to hear about the wildfire prize. Yeah. We have that problem too. Um, let's now move on from the, uh, the, the history of X Prize to talk about uh, the, the field of these people here, um, new energy solutions. Um, perhaps I could start by asking, why hasn't there been an X Prize in this field? I'm, I'm aware that a few years ago there was a competition for, I think it was called Designing a, a Breakthrough Energy Prize. I think that was um, a, a sort of proposal for an X Prize. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, we, we do want and desire, I mean, we have energy and environment sustainability as one of the core cornerstones, the areas that we're looking at prizes. And uh, we've talked about, you know, one of the questions on prizes is always, is the economy, is industry uh, driving it sufficiently? Would a prize, you don't want to set up a prize for something that's going to happen anyway, right? You, the analogy I use is you don't want to go and kiss the wind in the winter circle like, oh, you know, you were going to do this anyway. Here's a prize so we can, you know, uh, get glory for the prize benefactor or the prize organization. That's not a good idea. You really want to have prizes for areas that are not moving fast enough or there's no capital flowing into that sector or people think it's not possible, um, which brings us to, you know, sort of the, the topic at hand. Um, I've always felt like uh, a great use for, use for an XPRIZE would be something around uh, cold fusion, low uh, LENR uh, type, um, because obviously, you know, a few decades ago, there was a series of events that led to a great stigma about, well, you can't do research in that area. Uh, one of the prizes I'm working on right now uh, which I mentioned is this age reversal prize, which five to 10 years ago would have had a similar type of reaction from people saying, oh, that's a crazy idea. I cannot believe you're funding that. Uh, and you know, with the work that uh, Dr. David Sinclair and George Church um, uh, and others have done, it's become really a hot area of research. And our hope is not just bringing more capital and talent to the table, but also to change the perspective of what people think is possible. I think one of the things that prizes do is people go from, oh, interesting, uh, can that happen to when is it going to happen, right? It, uh, uh, it provides that sort of uh, that question and that vector. So I do believe that uh, uh, LENR and related fields are potentially a great place, um, you know, where if people, you know, if people are working on a subject that people consider kind of crazy, right? And I like to say the day before something is truly a breakthrough, it's a crazy idea. So we do need to have a sufficient number of people inside, cover, inside government, inside companies, inside scientific institutions working on crazy ideas. Otherwise, you're stuck in incrementalism. Um, so how do we incentivize people to take uh, shots at what traditional uh, communities consider crazy ideas and not damage their careers? Well, I think incentive competitions are a great way to do that because uh, it gives you an excuse. You say, well, wh why are you going to risk your career on that? Well, have you heard there's a $100 million prize to go and win that? Of course, I'm going to give it a shot, You know, even if there's a small chance. Um, so... Uh, anyway, let me pause there. Um, but perhaps I could press you a, a little bit on the question as to, to why it hasn't happened before. Because the, the kind of factors that you've just described ha have, have been fairly constant uh, going back several years now. When I first wrote publicly a, about this field, uh, I, I, I was interested as a philosopher of science uh, in the reputation problems and suggested that 
given that it was clear that work in this field needed to be done because the, the, the cost of missing something could be so high, um, given the need for, for new sources of energy. I, I, um, no, e even to someone like me coming um, from philosophy, I could see we needed to change the incentive structure. And I actually suggested in, in that first piece that perhaps we need an X prize. Uh, and that was six or seven years ago. Um, so, I, and as I said, I was aware that there was a, a, a competition to try to design an X prize. I'm, I'm curious about why it, it didn't happen. Uh, so, I would say that the reason that we haven't gone as pure play, if you would, as going saying a, a Cold Fusion Prize or LNR, LNR Prize is uh, we've got to find the capital behind these things. And um, what we typically will do is get a grant uh, to figure out what the rules would be. Is there a viable prize there in the first and foremost? So like, for example, on the age reversal prize, uh, Sergey Young uh, and um, Michael Antonov put up the seed capital because, you know, they put up a half million bucks and said, let's figure out if there's a there there. And, uh, uh, and then I was then able to get Chip Wilson to commit to his, and then I've committed capital to it and others, and it starts to build momentum there. Um, and so I think in this area there, it hasn't been clear, uh, you know, heretofore where that seed capital or where the prize capital would come from. And there's just a lot of pressing problems, but this one is a disproportionate, uh, you know, reward potential. Um, so, uh, I do, I, it's something that I'm, I remain excited by and, and, you know, lend my voice to uh, something that I think we should be doing. Um, um, but it's, I, think it's, I think it's access to, to capital, right? Who's going to step up and put up the money? By the way, you know, with all of these prizes, if no one wins, you don't pay out the money. I mean, it's like, it's like throwing yourself a touchdown pass. Mm. It's, uh, it's, it's crazy uh, not to be doing... You know, and for me, I, I think there's so much capital sitting on the sidelines doing nothing that it just angers me. Do you think that there's a, a significant difference between uh, a, a prize in this field and in uh, all or most of the other fields in that in this case, it's more of, would be more about basic science, about a, a sort of proof of principle of the existence of certain kinds of phenomena? rather than a clear technological goal. Does, would that make a big difference? I mean, I, I think in, in talking to some of the individuals who hopefully will, will step up the microphone in our Q&A and, and share what we'd be talking about, I, I, I think the, the issue here is, uh, is that the most important thing in this realm is repeatability, replicability. Uh, is can you actually when we write it when we come up with a prize it's got to be clear measurable objective and you need to know when you've done it and the world needs to know when you've done it uh, and in in this in this arena uh, it's not going to be enough for someone to claim ta-da I've done it here's the printout uh, it's going to be uh, fundamental uh, that it be replicated independently um, at least once, if not more. Uh, and only then, uh, and that begins, right? That's zero to one. And then that begins the process of now, can we, can we actually turn this into a viable energy source and commercialize? Okay, I think it's time to uh, open up the Q&A to the floor. Uh, I'm very curious to hear the questions from uh, this fascinating group of people we have here. Um, the practicalities, we've now got two microphones, one on either side of the room by the white pillars. So could you um, line up at one or other of them? And please, um, please introduce yourself um, before you ask your question. Sure. Uh, I'm Rob Kimball with uh, uh, Solidic. And I'm wondering, uh, do you have a, uh, a time frame roadmap for when the prize would be offered? That do you, is this paced by when uh, the capital is is uh, secured or the 
metrics for measuring are secure? What's what's the roadmap yeah. for? So, uh, thank you for your question. And you know, this is a prize in concept. Uh, you can imagine the analogy to the movie industry, where we have just the beginnings of a script here that's got to be turned into a screenplay, and then it's got to be have the actors attached to it and funded them. You know, I'm based in LA, so that's an analogy, or maybe it's their analogy is the pharma industry. But uh, we've had some uh, conversations uh, back and forth between XPRIZE and Anthropocene, just brainstorming uh, rule sets. Uh, Matt, who's in the audience there, and Carl have been part of the, uh, uh, the ongoing conversations. Um, and, you know, I think we first, we have a set of guidelines that we're trying to feel out uh, and we think there is a viable construct for a prize. Um, I personally think this should be uh, something like a $100 million prize in that it should bring players from around the world uh, and, and pull people out of their labs and out of the uh, closet, so to speak, to go and work on this. Uh, because you know, if it's one, it's a huge, uh, a huge uh, uh, payoff for the planet. Uh, we, you know, these prizes would need to have a uh, a viable test lab. Uh, that would be a. Uh, so we need someone who's going to fund the prize. Uh, X Prize, if this were a funded prize, would be super happy to uh, to promote, operate, support. Um, we need a lab that's going to be doing the third-party independent testing. So when we did the oil spill cleanup facility cleanup uh, X Prize, uh, we ended up uh, partnering with the government, uh, which has a large uh, facility in, called OMSET. I have no idea what the acronym stands for, but it's the world's largest oil spill cleanup facility. Didn't know it was one of those, but there was one in New Jersey. And uh, all of the teams tested their equipment head to head in that facility. We had a very accurate gallons per hour removed uh, in, in that regard. So we would need to find a, a lab that would uh, be the gold standard to, to say, yay, verily, we replicated this, or nope, didn't get replicated, um, we don't buy it. Um, I forgot to mention you can also submit your questions using the app, and they'll appear in front of me here. One has just appeared, but I'm going to try to keep the queue. You're next, sir. And, and then. Yeah. Hi there. Uh, my name is Oliver Barham from the US Navy, uh, mechanical engineer. And I have uh, two questions. Uh, one of them is about the raising the capital. Uh, how do you convince the people with access to capital to give money for a prize versus investing in a company that could potentially bring them a lot of reward? Uh, and then uh, second, um, and not necessarily related, but uh, have there ever been any unintended negative effects from a prize? Was there ever a time where a prize didn't work out the way you expected or had any effect that was uh, negative in any way? Because it seems like the prize is just a great idea and we should be doing them all the time. So I'm curious if there's any negatives. Thanks. So, Oliver, thanks for your questions. Uh, to my knowledge, there haven't been any negatives. I'm sure there have been that I don't know of or could be. So, you know, nothing's perfect. Uh, you know, uh, in terms of the economic incentives for this, we have had, you know, uh, for our age reversal prize, for example, uh, one of the rules we have is that uh, if you're a benefactor for the prize, we will uh, negotiate with the teams uh, options for you to invest in the company or ac early access to treatment. So that can be part of the rule set um, if, that's, if that's desired. But you know, there's trillions of dollars on the sideline right now from, uh, from everybody, all the billionaires worldwide. This is not a corporation that's gonna fund this. This is gonna be an individual or a foundation um, that this is just part of their portfolio play. And one of the other benefits of these prizes, Oliver, is that uh, a lot of times you think you know who the players are in the field. Like, you know, it's two or three. And, and the venture capital business is this way, where you pre-choose 
okay, I know that company and that company, I'm gonna invest in that company. Um, when you put up a prize, instead of looking for a needle in the haystack, the needle comes to you. So you don't know all the players uh, out of, you know, around the world. These are typically global prizes. So you'll see teams uh, from <coughs> places unexpected come forward with their ideas. Remember, I, I mentioned that unless you're enabling crazy ideas, you're stuck in incrementalism. So uh, one of the benefits of prizes is you see a multitude, you get a relationship with hundreds of, of teams and there's no restriction for you to be able to, you know, you know when, it, when a team wins this thing, it's just the beginning of the race, it's not the end, right? Um, it's they're gonna need to scale and commercialize and get the bugs out and so forth. So I think there's plenty of room for capital. Um, I just think a lot of times the reason people don't get involved in prizes that are big and audacious like this is they're afraid of being embarrassed. Uh, they are afraid of putting their name on a prize that uh, other people may think is kind of crazy. Uh, and that's unfortunate, uh, but is part of the human dynamic. Thank you, Peter. Um, next question over here, please. Okay. My name is Alan Smith um, from Net Zero Scientific in England. I want to loop back to your question about, or your, your thoughts on parameter space, because LENR is a very broad church. It, it covers a whole variety of technologies and techniques. And for example, I could see the situation where somebody could produce a, a device that costs five bucks that produces a few milliwatts of electricity, for example, that's very small and very compact, and yet somebody else may have spent half a million dollars producing a machine that produces perhaps 100 watts. Very different in concept, in, in, the, in construction, and in principles of operation. How, how could you decide between those things? Yeah, uh, listen, uh, Alan, I agree with you. I don't have an answer. It's still early. We've been bouncing back and forth ideas. Um, uh, you know, we're, let me back it up a second. Uh, when we originally, you know, uh, we're trying to figure out the rules for the Ansari X Prize for spaceflight. I want you to imagine the conversation uh, saying, listen, uh, you, this prize should be a prize that goes to the moon, or this prize should go, be a prize that go to orbit. And I'm like, no, 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 this is gonna be a suborbital prize. In fact, we started at 100 miles altitude and lowered the altitude target from 100 miles to 100 kilometers, uh, knowing full well most Americans won't know the difference between 100 miles and 100 kilometers anyway. <laughs> but, uh, but it was, we looked at the reentry uh, uh, thermal characteristics for uh, composites, 100 miles was too high in altitude. And we just, we wanted to get something, Right, so the goal is, you know, I like to say the, the ratio of something to nothing is infinite. We wanted to get something that was opening up the commercial spaceflight industry. Um, and we ended up through that competition uh, getting a lot of attention globally. Uh, you know, uh, I've known Bezos since college and Elon for 23 years now and, um, and Bramson, God knows, I pitched him a dozen times on, on funding the original prize, but it would, that lowered the, the activation entry for commercial companies. We also got the laws and regulations in the United States changed for commercial spaceflight uh, because of that prize. Um, it didn't exist beforehand. And Marion Blakey, the head of the FAA, uh, basically got the regulations to allow a US private team to make this kind of a flight versus having it one in Russia or Argentina. So I think we don't know the, the rule set yet. I think the goal is to get lots of players and unleash capital and imagination and get people thinking um, in non-traditional fashion uh, to move this field forward, bringing more, more cognitive surplus to the table, so to speak. Um, but we do have, we, we have a lot more work to do on is there a there there on the rule set. Okay, thank you. I, I would say, talking about unleashing capital, it's possibly 
important to remember that in a field like this, you need to unleash a little capital at the beginning as well as at the end. I, <laughs> I, totally, I totally get it. One of the elements, Alan, that I, uh, you know, a winner-take-all scenario is not where XPRIZE has been heading of late. We're, we're looking to design the prizes so that the top teams or the most, uh, the most promising teams, if you would, or the teams that have interesting approaches are getting uh, small aliquots of capital in the beginning and then larger along the way. We're staging it, but still with the big carrot at the end. It's a great plan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Alan. Um, the next question is going to come from the app here, uh, and it's from Bob Grinier, uh, who says, what about trying a prize for practical solutions to making nuclear waste extinct by re remediation, perhaps using LENR? Uh, to do this would be transfor transformational to energy generation transitions via nuclear, and also to acceptance of the LENR field. So, listen, I, I believe that energy remains a very fertile place for us to uh, be finding X prizes. Um, you know, I'm a fan of other areas like room temperature superconductors for transmission lines and, uh, and power beaming at, 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 at distance. And there's, a, and, you know, there's so many places that we can improve. So, um, we are going to be switching up XPRIZE from XPRIZE. XPRIZE 1.0 was me looking to fund the original Spaceflight Prize. 2.0 is what we've been doing, which has been a little bit of a random walk in different areas. XPRIZE 3.0 is going to be much more intentional, and energy and environment is one of our core. And so we're going to be doing a broad call for ideas and prizes, uh, and I welcome that, and we'll be sharing where people can, can put forward their prize ideas. Next, please. Thank you, Peter. Next question, um, you, sir. Hi, Peter. My name is Les Moon, and I'm with Green Tech Talks. And, you know, Carl had brought up the importance of community, and I'm curious with regard to the discussions of laboratories and the impact or the, the um, you know, the role of the technology research. What role can public-private partnerships play in um, promulgating and kind of leveraging the money that's going into the X Prize initiatives? In other words, do you see opportunity to not just promulgate investors down the road, but maybe governments and, and the community in general? So I, I think the, the general community here needs to be an amplifier to anything we do, all right, in terms of reaching out to people uh, to prospective teams. A lot of what an XPRIZE does is also change the conversation. Um, and uh, it's the, the breakthrough is just the beginning, but the, the expectation of what the future is going to be like given this and education uh, is, is definitively uh, uh, key for the community. Uh, having a breakthrough occur in silence uh, is a failure mode for us. Uh, it's really important that when anything, when we announce this prize, hopefully it will be a next prize sometime. When it's announced, uh, the world needs to be excited about it. People need to understand why this is so exciting. What does this mean? How does this transform society? Uh, I think otherwise, if it's if it's so if it's if it's not properly understood. Uh, the value of this will, will not meet the potential magnitude it has for, for humanity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you, sir. Uh, yes, hello. My name is David Niebauer. I'm with Berluin Energy. Um, and my, Hi, my question or comment really kind of follows on what we were just talking about. It does seem to me, in order to fund this prize, we need a review committee that have of very high prestige um, scientists or individuals who are recognized, in, and maybe like first uh, someone to lead a review committee like that. You know, what is the profile of that individual? You know, I think of someone like Neil Neil deGrasse Tyson, you know, or somebody like that who has who is recognized, generally speaking, um, but also can come and bring some prestige to the review committee to gain excitement and energy and interest. And then, you know, from people who don't know the field, they'll also say, well, you know, if this person is looking at this, there must be something there. 
So this is kind of an appeal to the community to think about what is the profile of that individual to lead the review committee, uh, and can we kind of reach into our contacts and find somebody who could be uh, that level of prestige that could help lead the, the effort, uh, both from financing and also recognition around the, around the world for what's going on. Sure, I, I, good points, and anybody, you know, I, I think Anthropocene is gonna be the uh, conduit and the receptacle for ideas here, so uh, Frank and Carl and the team there, because um, this really has been uh, uh, championed by them. XPRIZE is, you know, again, will support uh, if we're able to capitalize this properly, launching this, but that's not our core area of expertise, right? This is, uh, this is for Anthropocene. I will say uh, that when I announced the original XPRIZE, um, I had a concept I'll share with you along the lines you just said called giving birth to an idea above the line of super credibility. So there's this line of credibility in our minds, and if you announce an idea below the line of credibility to the world, People dismiss it out of hand. That's stupid. Never happened, right? If your kid next door says you're going to fly to Mars, you dismiss it. Then there's this line of credibility where uh, if you announce an idea above the line of credibility, people will follow it and say, interesting, wow, it's, he's really doing it. It's getting better and better. Um, or, you know, no, I gave, it, I gave it a shot, but it's not happening. And then there's this line of super credibility that if you announce an idea above the line of super credibility, people go, oh my God, that's amazing. How can I be part of it? So when I announced the original Ansari X Prize um, back in 1996, May 18th, uh, under the arch in St. Louis, I didn't have the money back then. And uh, let me just preempt a question. My board will never allow me to launch a prize without having the money in place again. So that isn't gonna happen. Uh, but what I did do was we announced it under the arch in St. Louis. I had not one astronaut, but 20 astronauts on stage. I had uh, Dan Golden, the head of the FAA, and Patty Gray Smith, head of, I'm sorry, Dan Golden, head of NASA, and, and Patty, head of uh, uh, commercial space, or space at FAA. Uh, the Lindbergh family was there, and when it was announced, we had enough super credibility that was front page around the world, and no one asked, do you have the money, which we didn't, do you have any teams, which we didn't, but it was uh, by virtue of our peerage and who was with us on stage, it had so much credibility that that, that transmitted strongly. So we would need to do the same um, when this is announced, having the right leadership from the government, um, the right leadership from, uh, from commercial industry and from the appropriate scientists on the planet to say, you know, this is important for science to take a shot at. I'm going to bring in now here a, a brief question from the app, uh, which partly you've just answered, Peter. Uh, Mark Owensby says, is it possible to offer a prize pending funding? This would make it more concrete to potential investors, uh, i.e. the Gates Foundation, he says. Yeah, I mean, the short answer is is no. I think it discredits the rest of the prizes. Uh, you know, we when we launch a prize, we enter into a contractual agreement with the teams through a master team agreement in which we say if you accomplish A, B, and C in a in the measured in this following way, uh, then we'll write you a check uh, for this amount. But it's not just the money, of course. It's promoting them to the world. And uh, for us, the worst thing that can happen is a lot of energy happens, a lot of people, and then it never, uh, it never materializes. I remember uh, it took me, we announced in May of 96, uh, I met Anusha Ansari, who is now the CEO of the XPRIZE. She funded our first XPRIZE. We named it the Ansari XPRIZE in her honor. She's since traveled to the space station privately. I'm very proud. She came back three years ago to serve as the CEO of the organization. She runs it. I serve as executive chairman. Um, uh, during the five years between announcing the prize and finally, and, and God knows, I asked 150 people to fund that $10 million prize, and everyone said, can anyone really do it? Isn't someone going to die trying? And, you know, uh, why isn't NASA doing it? Um, ultimately, uh, I had teams calling me every week saying, we're building our ship, we've got a reliance on you, Are you is this thing funded yet? I just don't want to go through that again. <laughs> 
Peter, I think we've got time for one more short question. The gentleman over here has been waiting for some time. Yeah, my name is Dan Shumsky. I'm an independent scholar. And I guess the, I'm relating to uh, what you're saying about the review of these projects. And I think back to Thomas Kuhn and his uh, structure of scientific revolution, in which he talks about the person who comes up with the paradigm as being someone who is, first of all, brand new to the field, an outsider, someone who doesn't really have uh, the background to do what they are doing. And I think about the review process that goes on in the science community today and the review process that you have to undergo, which is, uh, I hope, somewhat different. The success in this field uh, is at ri you know, is risky to everybody else in the field, right? When, it, it, when you have a breakthrough, it means a new paradigm. The experts no longer are the experts. There has been. So you have a disincentive in some degree to have a, a transformation in any, a, a revolution in any field. Uh, it, it, uh, and so the existing players uh, may not want you to succeed. Yeah, the, the scientific principles have to be uh, open to question and open to acceptance in a different light. Thank, thank, thank you, sir. I'm, I'm afraid we're out of time. Um, so I'd just like you all to join me in thanking Peter for what I found to be a really fascinating conversation. <laughs>